Heals welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heals is the largest non governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heals was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives, and advocates from around the world to meet, network, and forge new scientific collaborations. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk about supercentenarians and the immunobiome, which is a part of aging research that I found, find extremely interesting. So first, uh, I'd like to remind everyone, and you probably heard plenty yesterday, what aging is. And it's essentially the failure of the body to repair itself with the passage of time. And what is then a supercentenarian? That is a person who has lived for over 110 years, and it's a, a bit of an arbitrary term, because some people use it for people who are only 107 and 108, but the, uh, the gerontology research group, which tracks every supercentenarian in the world, they define it as over 110, because uh, if you will need to include everyone at age 107 or so, then uh, they will be far too many to, to track. And there are about 9 out of 10 supercentenarians are female, so for some reason that is still not really elucidated, we know that uh, a Females do much better than males when it comes to extreme longevity, and that cannot easily be explained by lifestyle factors and risk behaviors either. And here are some uh, uh, longevity factors. Uh, for example, APOE, FOXO3A, that are well-known uh, longevity factors. Uh, but uh, the studies are not consistent when it comes to supercentenarians uh, because uh, very often, you pe people who research centenarians, they group supercentenarians together with centenarians. Uh, but a supercentenarian is uh, uh, much more rare than a centenarian. Only about one in 700 to one in 1,000 centenarians live to become a supercentenarian. So it, it doesn't make much sense to, to say that someone who is 100 and someone who is well over 110 are in the same uh, category especially not when it comes to probability. And here's our healthy, natural aging process. <laughs> and as you can see, uh, the human body does a very good job until uh, about age 45 at repairing itself. I mean, when you're 40, you might have some gray hair and some small wrinkles and maybe just run at 98% of the speed of a 20-year-old, but uh, when it comes to mortality, it, you still have to wait until about 45 until it really starts changing a lot. But when you become a supercentenarian, then your chance of dying within the next year is essentially 50%, and it goes up at, at 113 to about 70%. So when uh, it is harder to live from 110 to 111 than to live in it from birth to 80 in the first place. So this is something going on here that, that really needs to be uh, researched and uh, examined to find out what uh, actually causes this uh, extreme uh, mortality level. And uh, something that is more dramatic that you can see here is the decline of the immune system with the uh, age. Uh, in the earlier uh, 
when you are between 50 and 70 years old, uh, you already see a, a clear increase in uh, cardiovascular disease and cancer, but uh, it's especially here after 70, 75, that the curve starts to take off when it comes to deaths from pneumonia. As you can see here in the, in the top uh, curve here, you can see the hospitalizations for pneumonia, and especially mortality, it gets extremely hard to treat pneumonia when you, you reach uh, that age. So it's clear there are much problem with the immune system for the very old people, and that is a lethal factor. And the uh, Henne Holstig, that uh, was at the last uh, Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging, she uh, uh, researched centenarians, and uh, especially a, a Dutch woman who was uh, named Hendrikie van Andelschipper, who lived to 115. Uh, and what they found uh, in her, because she donated her body to, to uh, science, um, and they found that um, all the uh, all her leukocytes, white blood cells, uh, derived from two stem cell clones, and that's highly abnormal because when you're young, there, there are several thousands in the body, but for some reason, they seem to have dwindled down to, to only two in her, so it's clear that this is some kind of limit for how long the immune system can uh, function. And I, I go further to Elia Meshniko, the father of gerontology, according to some, uh, but he proposed that bacteria cause aging, which he might partly be correct in here. We have the human microbiome. Uh, we have uh, in our mouth, our uh, vagina, if you're a female, and skin, and uh, everywhere in the nostrils, and body cavities, but it's especially the gut microbiome that has been studied. and you have a de several domains in the human microbiome, but it, uh, it's mainly bacteria that seems to, to matter a lot and that we have a good data on nowadays when it comes to aging research. And there are three enterotypes, main bacteroids, Prevotella and Ruminococcus. <laughs> and as you can see here, for example, in mice, you see clear uh, changes in the microbiome with, with age between young and middle age and old age, certain uh, uh, bacteria tend to dominate our others at different ages. And the gut bacteria might, might have a very beneficial effect. For example, here you can see in the intestine pneumonas that uh, fructose lysine is metabolized to butyrate uh, and that's beneficial uh, for our health, and uh, it's clear that gut bacterium therefore seems to uh, matter in how much age product you, you might actually accumulate as a consequence of living over time. And as people here, pr probably most of you know, uh, the body accumulates advanced glycation and products throughout the, tis the tissues during aging, and that the, is linked to, to diseases with, uh, which ultimately leads to death and like arteri arterial stiffness and several organ failures. And uh, if the certain people then, thanks to their gut, uh, metabolize this better than others, they are at a clear advantage, uh, regardless of how they eat also. And here you can see that the microbiome clearly influences cardiovascular disease. Uh, for example, here you, you See, choline gets metabolized to, to TMA. Uh, that uh, gets further to TMA oxide, which leads to uh, arterial uh, atherosclerosis. And of course, atherosclerosis is a, a big factor when it comes to aging, especially people dying between 70 and uh, 90, uh, less so actually when it comes to supercentenarians. Another big problem in supercentenarians are also uh, protein aggregation and protein misfolding in the body that is not uh, uh, cleared uh, by the body over time and it eventually accumulates to a point where it uh, leads to organ failure and uh, 
Uh, we talked about it yesterday with Salvatore Ventura. Um, so we had uh, several interesting researches here on, on transuterine amyloidogenesis and uh, it's especially the, the senile uh, type that tends to kill uh, the supercentenarians uh, as examined by, uh, by Dr. Stephen Coles, who sadly passed away two years ago. He founded the, the gerontology research group to track every supercentenarian in the, in the world and ultimately uh, get samples from them and uh, uh, learn why they live so long and especially why they don't live even longer. And the reason for why amyloid fibrils accumulates in the body are of course because they are in the lowest uh, energy state. So they, they stay, you see, you see here in the energy diagram. And of course you have several uh, amyloid related diseases. Everyone knows about Alzheimer, uh, your familiar amyloidosis, some have very dramatic visual effects like here in the uh, eye. You have a, in Sweden for example, uh, in northern Sweden, you have familial amyloidosis in, in uh, many families. It's a not that rare disease because it's inherited in certain villages. Um, and here you can see how it looks like a, with histology, uh, the amyloid deposits between the heart cells. And here you can see how it uh, accumulates within the body. And uh, here is especially the, the senile type of amyloidosis. It, doesn't, it is not correlated to a very specific known mutation, but by definition, the people who, who live to 110 or e, even further beyond 110, they must be more uh, resistant to this type of pathology uh, than others. And that is must likely be uh, because of some inherited advantage in uh, being able to neutralize and not accumulate these uh, products. And uh, as uh, we, we discussed yesterday, also 25% of 85 year olds already have this uh, uh, clinical deposits in their hearts of this protein junk, which is essentially makes the heart choke and it gets harder and harder for it to pump and perform its function. But it, it's not known, unfortunately, why, uh, why if uh, people in their 80s uh, are dying of this in the same way as supercentenarians tend to die of this if it was because of this or if it's just uh, accumulated to a benign state. But uh, if you take the sense approach, you will of course say that everything that is not in a healthy 25 year old shouldn't be there anyway. So. And now Sense Research Foundation uh, are doing some project uh, in uh, Harvard uh, to, and they have made great progress in uh, making catalytic antibodies against TTR uh, amyloid with the hopes of being able to get it on a, on a market uh, eventually to break it uh, uh, down and develop a therapy. And the, this will essentially be a way to be able to extend the, the lifespan of the oldest old since this seems to be a, a limiting factor together with what, as I mentioned before, the failure of the immune system to, to do its job. So here we can see, uh, as I discussed, uh, amyloidosis, we have the hallmarks of aging with uh, DNA damage, and telomere shortening, mitochondrial uh, stem cell depletion and so on. And uh, in the case of the Dutch woman who uh, uh, lacked blood stem cells, uh, we can see it here, clearly stem cell depletion is a, is a factor in uh, uh, limiting her uh, uh, lifespan, even, that, even though she didn't die of that. But many supercentenarians super die from uh, easy infections like a normal cold or a pneumonia or a urinary tract infection due to the slightest uh, bacteria at the nursing home, for example. Even if they're in relatively good shape, they, they don't need to be very frail or bedridden, they can still be able to function somewhat independently. But once you reach well over 100, even if you're relatively functional, uh, you still don't seem to be able to to get a, uh, by a cold, for example. So, uh, 
And then, of course, we have glycation here. That is the important factor of aging. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Questions? <laughs> so the subject of the panel discussion is whether aging is a disease. Uh, it's difficult to see how it wouldn't be called a disease after that. But um, yeah, that was it. All right. So uh, I'm not sure how relevant this is, but I've read some articles on that uh, there were ways to look how to replace the immune system through stem cell therapies. So if you could manage to do that, uh, what would this mean for these super centurions? Well, uh, uh, it might buy them some uh, a few additional years, but not uh, that much, I would guess. And it's also, of course, a very uh, a complicated procedure to, to do that. doesn't really exist by now, but even if it were to be impl implemented, you still have, uh, the, for example, the protein misfolding damages, amyloidosis and so on, that really limits lifespan together. Fibrosis, uh, glycation, and many, many other. Maybe I can reply a little bit to that, and that is, you know, it's not just the cells, the stem cells who run off, it's also the systemic environment in which these cells sit. So if you have a pro-inflammatory state, for example, or if the uh, growth factors in the blood are not correct, then the stem cells are, might not get necessary signals to divide or may, you know, differentiate in the wrong way, and then your immune system is not working, not because you don't have enough stem cells, but because the environment is not correct. Yeah. So it's not just about replacing the cells, it's bigger. Research was done on MS patients where, where they used chemotherapy drugs to completely wipe out the immune system and it was then repopulated using their own stem cells. Um, so it was rebooting. So yes, it, they were still in the same environment that they were before, but it was a rebooting of the immune but system. But they were rather young, or? Yeah, they, yeah, they, they had certainly weren't centenarians, yeah. no. Yeah, I don't think they might survive chemotherapy. Edward? This is just to continue on those points. Um, you have Henrik here, I think, yeah. uh, who uh, lived long, and uh, um, her daughter, who is a scientist, uh, analyzed uh, her, her blood cells and found out that there was a, a mutation somehow uh, in uh, one of her uh, white blood cells, yeah. in, in her black white blood cells, and in that, in fact, she was probably surviving thanks to two uh, warrior stem cells, or even one that further differentiated, um, right, in terms of uh, forming white blood cells. And also, with respect to what we just said, there is an experiment by Leaping Tongue, again, as I said yesterday, um, that irradiated mice and then injected, uh, uh, well, bone marrow uh, in aged mice, quite aged mice, I don't remember, maybe 22 months old, you can check, um, and they lived longer. Was, was maximum lifespan extended, uh, and how would you define that maximum lifespan when you? Sorry, no, my my question, my my, uh, it was just a further discussion on okay. that uh, topic, yeah. but okay. uh, on uh, on uh, replacing the immune system in aged persons. One further question for Victor before we start. I was just wondering um, if you know which um, mutations uh, define the supercentenarian and the centenarian populations. Well, for supercentenarians, uh, there is a lack of studies. There is no known mutation uh, that is common in supercentenarians. Uh, I know the studies by Dr. Coles and, and Stuart Kim and, and in California, uh, but there, there is nothing that they have in, in common. Uh, it's rather that they are abnormally normal in a sense that the body uh, operates abnormally well rather than that they have a specific mutation that will link them together. Well, 
it, it may also be that whatever mutations that allow these people to survive so long are, you know, rare enough that uh, you won't be able to pick them up with any type of Chiva studies. You know, what, you know, maybe there are, s I'm just speculating, of course, you know, what if there are 40 different types of mutations that allow one to become a super centenarian, then, you know, maybe two, three people on the world have one of them, and, you know, we, are, we don't even have studies with more than, than a handful of super centenarians, you know, maybe, 40 super centenarians will be sequenced. So we find some, you know, we, we can't pick up any mutation there. But what we can say, at least, th this is not a matter of just being able to delay amyloidosis for longer. These people age slower, and I have lots of anecdotal evidence. I've met super centenarians and seen pictures of them at younger ages that they do not look their aged when they are 50 and 70 and 90 and so on. They, they Most of them live independently until well over 100, for example. This is the biological clock likely affecting many parts of the system. Okay, uh, David. I want to ask about the mortality rate and uh, the f how it changes over age. And you showed at the beginning that if you're 110, there's only a very small chance that you'll survive to 111 and so on. And as you know, there's the famous Gompertz curve that says when you, in the, from about 35 onwards to about 90, Every eight years you live, you double your, you half your chance, your mortality. But the mortality seems to slow down at that top end. If we, thought, if we extrapolate that curve beyond, then anybody who's 110 has zero chance of living one more year. So I mean, it does slow down. And various people like Michael Rose have thought there's something quite significant about, the, he calls it the end of aging, or when aging stops. And have, I mean, have you looked at the, the curve at all? Is well, I mean, uh, uh, that seems to be something he has seen in fruit flies, but that's not observed when it comes to human. And I mean, we have a, a, the GRG has tracked 2,500 people over 110 years old, uh, and four out of 2,500 are alive seven years later. So uh, the, the data is very clear, and there is no indication that you will slow aging after 90 in that sense in humans. But, but the rate of increase of mortality has slowed compared to what it was for the most of life. So it is, uh, there's a plateau in the curve, and I, I just wonder if people understand what's driving that change. It's I'm not sure. Uh, it, uh, it's not true in supercentenarians, at least. This uh, has been the same for about a decade and more, at least. Well, many thanks to Victor.